So I grew up in uh, Woodhaven, Queens, Jamaica Avenue. It was on the border of East New York, Brooklyn. Uh, they nicknamed my neighborhood Death Haven uh, because of all the uh, violence, murders, uh, people who were dying, uh, drugs. You know, so it was it was a known neighborhood. We had an area called the Dome. It was up in the park. It was something you would see out of kind of the movies. I mean, to us it was normal because we young kids growing up in that area. But uh, as I'm growing up and I'm going in that area, you can basically go up to the dome and, and uh, it was like a five and dime store of drugs, weapons, and uh, anything that you wanted to you know, buy, they had it up there. So you know, locally to Jamaica Avenue was Kennedy Airport. So that was used as a hub for all of us to, to uh, hijack trucks, give me up trucks. And all that swag would end up in our neighborhood, you know, sometimes sold in bulk and then other times sold to individuals who would take it up into the dome and we'd, you know, buy it up there or sell it up there. And eventually, as I got older, it'd become uh, me selling it up there and putting guys up there at different locations around the neighborhood selling drugs for me. But to start off as a kid, I was a, a young boy that came from a family that just came from Albania. My father was born over in Albania. And uh, it was it was a rough country, uh, known for being at war since the Ottoman days. Uh, it was no money. It was a third world country, suppressed uh, suppressed uh, communism. So when I came into you know, you know when I was born and my father came into the United States, married my mom. Uh, people really didn't know what Albania was. It wasn't. Uh, like saying you're Italian or Greek or you know another nationality, people really knew because the country was so closed down or locked down. You didn't have that many Albanians. So I grew up where my father uh, believed in violence as a protection, not as a use to uh, hurt people. He wanted to make sure that I could handle myself and not get bullied in the streets where he grew up in uh, Riverton and Delancey uh, down in Manhattan, Lower East Side was a tough neighborhood. That's the neighborhood where Vito Genovese was uh, born and raised and uh, guys like that, where my father uh, became friends with them, but on the outskirts, not uh, a gangster. He wasn't out there killing. He was a, a gambler. Uh, he was a street guy. He played dice on the street and stickball and box. And he knew all the gangsters and he got very friendly with guys like uh, Lucky Luciano's cousin, Blackie, Charlie Luciano, same name. And I uh, became one of his partners over the years. So these guys like Al Greco, tough gangsters, uh, killers, Al Greco was, was the uh, norm of people that I started uh, seeing as a young boy, three and four and five years old. I was on their laps in a, a Bronx Den card game that my uncle was partners with uh, Luciano and uh, Al Greco frequent and it was basically the strong arm for them. Uh, at that time, uh, guys like uh, Handsome Jack, and these are some of the nicknames and guys that uh, were my father's friends and partners in business and my uncles. So when I'm raised around them, I got a good look at uh, a diversity of real serious street guys uh, that uh, without them saying much, uh, you start understanding they're very powerful. You start understanding their control in the city, not just that Bronx uh, card game. And so as a kid, it was very natural for me to be and see violence, whether it was in my streets, whether it was around my father's friends, uh, whether it was in a boxing gym, or whether it was in the basement. My father had us in the basement, uh, me at three, my brother at four, and he'd put gloves on us and tell us to fight. And, you know, when you look back, people would say, wow, your father, uh, you know, they, they look at him in a hard way. I don't. I look at him in a loving way because what he taught me was to survive the streets that I ended up living in. You know, people say, well, your father was nuts for what he taught you. He didn't teach you schooling. My father taught me what he understood was the best way to survive. He did it out of love. He didn't do it out of uh, trying to develop me to be into a gangster. He tried to develop me into be a pro ball player. And at the same time, he developed me into a killing machine without realizing what he was doing to me. Uh, so I... I think the aggression started with me just as a simple thing, riding a, a tricycle at three years old. And by the time I'm four, I wasn't very coordinated, I, I guess, at those ages. I was very rough and tumble. And my brother was very, he was actually very graceful. So I would try to stay up with my older brother, which was very difficult because he was naturally graceful in sports and boxing. 
and I was very sloppy. And I, you know, if somebody asked me to do something and go around a curve with my bike, I'd just go through it. I'd go through the bushes, I'd fall. And people would cringe, my aunts, my grandmother, and they would say, Johnny, stop riding that bicycle. And instead, I'd just keep getting up and getting on the bike and I'd be all bruised up, I'd be bleeding everywhere. And my mother would plead with me, just don't ride a bike. You don't have to do what Jimmy does, your brother. Just do your own thing. So I was used to that blood, even riding a bicycle, I was used to the pain. And I started embracing it. Uh, the more that people said how tough I was, the more I, I played up to that. Even as a child, the more my father put me in the ring with my brother and he beat me up, the more I wanted to go in the ring and get beat up and show how tough I was. It wasn't necessarily about winning. It was about showing that I could take it. And as the years went on, uh, I just got more aggressive. And I started running around the streets. And my friends were very, very aggressive guys. I come from a neighborhood where guys were getting locked up at 11, 12 years old. And all my friends were killers. And they were shooting guys, stabbing guys. They were in reform schools. They were in juvie, uh, uh, spa fit, drug rehabs. At, at young ages, my friends were on a David Susskind show at 12 years old for violence and drugs. Uh, I wasn't really to that level at that time. So it was surprising for people to see as I kept aging that I was getting more and more violent and I started slowly passing my friends as far as uh, becoming that person that people really didn't think I was. But what they didn't see was the training that went behind it. At three years old, my father would have me down the basement doing five push-ups. At five years old, I was down a push down a basement doing 25 and 30 push-ups a set. Uh, at five years old, I was running a couple of miles. I'd go to the track with my father and I'd have to follow him while he was running because he was a boxer. And I started running by 10 years old. I'm running 10 miles myself. And I was in extremely good shape. So I was sitting in a boxing ring, uh, Lost Battalion Hall, with some famous fighters later on was Jerry Cooney and different guys like that, David Sears, uh, who fought Michael Spinks in the old days. And I'd look at these guys and these guys were top ranked up and coming pro fighters that I wanted to be just like them. I wanted to be tough like them. I wanted to be an Al Greco as a gangster. So everybody that I surrounded myself with were tough guys one way or another and street guys in my eyes. And you have my baseball coach, who was Fat Andy Ruggiano's son. So Fat Andy Ruggiano was uh, a captain, the boss of our neighborhood that was part of Murder, Inc. And Lucky Luciano and uh, Albert Anastasia was his guy. So Albert Anastasia straightened out Fat Andy Ruggiano, made, made him a made guy in 1954, I believe. This is my grandfather figure. This is my baseball coach's father. And this is a guy that starts really uh, opening my eyes to the next level of uh, becoming a killer. So by, I guess about 12 years old, I'm playing baseball and I'm using that bat to hit a ball. But then I start using that bat as favors to different gangsters saying, hey, can you go pick up money for me here or there? And it's a slow transition before you realize you're going to use that bat and put it over someone's head when they don't pay. So as a I believe I was 13, I was working in Diggs Deli, and uh, Louis Gaddy was a Lucchese guy, bookmaker, great guy, sharp dresser, another good role model as a gangster for me because he was successful. You know, in the street world, there's a lot of bums, but the guys I happen to be around are all successful, big money guys, tough guys, and sharp guys with, you know, driving beautiful cars. Back in those days when Lincoln and Caddy convertibles, uh, and I started looking every time I turned around, the next kid's looking at that baseball player, that actor, and I'm looking at that next gangster. And that next gangster is always opening my eyes to a future in the street. Not a petty street guy, but a guy that understood, hey, you can get out of this hood, but you have to be intelligent. You can be a killer or a tough guy, but you have to be intelligent. Any dummy can go put a bat across somebody's head. But you got to know when to do it. You know how to, you got to know how to get away with it, and you have to have the balls to be able to do it alone, not with ten guys and five guys. So I started understanding going with three and four and five guys that was a coward's move. But if you can go by yourself and do things, you can be very successful in this life. If you have one good friend, 
you can basically control the neighborhood. But you need to be very violent. You have to be very slick. And you have to be very loyal to the guys that you're working for and your bosses. And those days, it, was, it became Fat Andy Ruggiano. Uh, and his children were my, you know, my mentors, I guess, in, in the next level of the mob. So the problem with anything is when you get, a, when you get used to blood, when you, you get used to pain, when you get used to a, a simple thing of putting a bat across someone's head and there is no, there is no uh, feeling about it because I'm used to being hurt. I'm used to bleeding. I'm used to having broken bones. I'm used to having a broken arm and taking my cast off and playing baseball because I was trained for this to ignore the pain. So when I'm hitting somebody else, I'm not, I don't think I'm really understanding at that age. They're not used to this. They didn't sign up for this. Like I was uh, brought up as a kid to become a killer. They were just regular people that went in a little over their head. They weren't training for this. They didn't expect to get a bat across their head because they are uh, degenerate gamblers or they're somebody who doesn't pay or they're a con artist. They always think they're not going to be the victim. And I was trained to make the next guy the victim. So when most people are talking, they really aren't going to take it to that level. You'll hear a guy say, well, I'll put a bat across his head. It sounds good in front of a group of people, but they're not really going to do it. And as a young guy, I happened to be around guys like Al Greco. When he said he's going to put a bat across your head, he was doing it. 90% of these guys aren't about that, really. People don't understand that. They think, but you got a handful of these guys like Roy DeMeos uh, of the gang, the gangster world, or Fat Andy with Murder, Inc., and Albert Anastasia. These guys were real uh, gangsters. These are real killers. These guys are guys that were very quiet, uh, didn't say much, but their reaction and their action was violence. So as I started adapting to all my teachers, because that's really what they are. They're uh, professors of, of a world that, uh, especially back in the day, was, was very low key and quiet, except for the violent part. They taught me at, in those days to be very aggressive with your violence. And sometimes they taught me to do it publicly. So when I hurt somebody, a lot of times, I did it purposely where crowds would see and they'd understand uh, this face, remember it. That's my wallet. This is the way I'm going to make money. This is the way I'm going to control this neighborhood. This is the way I'm going to control the drug trade and any other thing I want to control. So when somebody did something or disrespected me, my organization, my guys, uh, I was very violent. I would be swift about it. I'd walk into a nightclub. And uh, example, I walked into a nightclub called Kickers on Metropolitan Avenue back in the uh, 80s. And we warned the bouncers that for now on, these you guys are going to be unionized. There is no more going to work without going through us. If you go to work on Friday, uh, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get shot. And I guess, you know, uh, on their, their behalf, people talk so they didn't take it serious, I guess. You know, they didn't, they don't understand the mob world. They didn't understand me. They didn't know, they didn't know me that I, the way I know me, obviously. And they didn't think that I, they just thought I was just another gangster, I guess, talking and giving an order. And they believed that their guy would protect them. And I warned the guy, uh, when I shoot you, when I hurt you, if you come to work, it doesn't matter what your guy says. You're already shot. You're already hurt. You're already killed. Don't go to work. So I get a phone call. And I'm home sleeping, and I hear they're all at work. It's Friday night. The music's pumping. Everybody's drinking. And I call my buddy, and I said to him, uh, come pick me up. He said, what are you going to do? I said, don't worry. Just come pick me up. He picks me up. It's uh, midnight about that. Uh, we get in the car. I load up a couple of guns. I got two guns. I used to like to take a, a revolver always. I didn't like uh, automatics because an automatic jammed on me once before. So I always had uh, that belief that the automatic, uh, there could be a problem, make sure you carry two guns. I actually carried three. I would carry an automatic, so I had the extra shots. I'd carry a revolver and I would carry a two-shot Derringer in a jock strap. 
in case I run out of anything, I have something left that people don't know I have on me. And uh, we get in the car, we pull up, I tell him to circle the block. There's a gas station around the corner from Kickers. And the, and the club changed names several times. Uh, they, they had a couple of different names, but the same owners and the people, and they were around uh, gangsters also, they were mobsters. Um, I pull up, I tell him, just stay in the parking lot. And he's a big guy, tough guy, Irish guy. And he says to me, no, 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 I'm gonna come with you. I said, I don't need you. So when we pull up to the bar, the one of the head managers is there. And as soon as I see him, I says, come here. And he goes, John, he's trying to talk. And my guy, without asking me, went to swing at him. But when he went to swing at him, I already shot him in the stomach. And so he looks at me with like a half smile. He goes, oh, I, th I thought I had him with a right hand. And, you know, people don't understand there's a dry sense of humor we do because we do it all the time. This is not something that uh, we do once in a while. In my case, I did it on a regular basis. After I shot him, one of the bouncers came out to react to the shooting, not realizing he's going to get shot. And him, I just uh, uh, hip shot. I believe I shot him in the, in the right or left. It doesn't matter. I hit him in one of the sides of his hip, and then he went down. I shot him in the leg. And then I continued, and I went inside the bar. And I found two other guys that I warned not to come in. One was some sort of manager, and he went to hit me, and my guy went to hit him, and then I shot him. And after I finished with him, I looked for one of the owners who went up the back and jumped out a side window, and then I caught the fourth guy uh, by the back door, and I shot him. I think he got shot up in the chest area somewhere, and then I, when he went down, I shot him again. So I shot the four guys, and my guy started to run out the door, and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa where are you going? Now the whole club, you can imagine, is in disarray. Everybody's running out. Everybody's screaming. The lights come on. The DJ music stops. And I put the gun and I pointed at one of the bartenders. I said, don't go nowhere. And I said, make me a, a drink. At that time, I was drinking vodka and cranberry. Now I switch it up to martinis. But at that time, it was vodka and cranberry. And he looked at me like I was insane. And I said, relax. I said, this has nothing to do with you. I ain't going to shoot you. Get me to drink. And I told my friend, sit down. So he, he's looking at me. He didn't understand. He goes, John, we're going to get pinched. Let's go. I go, relax. Sit down. I says, I got to make a statement here. And I wanted them to know that I came there and I'm not worried about anybody, not even law enforcement. And I had that drink. And I says, okay. And I didn't gulp it. I sipped it. I stayed. We walked out the door. I put the gun back under my shirt. And as we come there, the police are all pulling up. And you got probably 10 police cars there, ambulance, fire engines, EMS, everybody's there. And as we're walking out, we just point inside like the shooters are still inside. Nobody did nothing to us. We walked, we went around the corner, we got in our car, and we went back to our social club in Ozone Park. And I reported back that uh, this was taken care of. Now, I think they got the message now that the bounces uh, work through us so they don't work. And after that, when I go into club after club, naturally they're all on board. So it always takes, for some reason, it takes these guys to understand they're not in this world and to really get it when they see that guys are getting shot, when they see guys are getting killed. When someone comes looking for me for your revenge, and we jump in a car, and when we jump in that car, we're not jumping in that car talking. I'm telling guys, when they jump in that car with me, you're the driver, you're the backup car. I'm gonna go kill this guy. I'm not just talking, so I tell them, set up a car, steal a car, get me guns, and I put things in motion. And, and back in those days, Larry Cuccarelli was one of the guys with me. He's dead, he died of a heart attack, but his family's around. And uh, I said, jump in the car with me. He goes, John, I go, just get me the guns. So we get in the car, and one of the guys who was looking for me for another incident, he's driving on the Interboro Parkway heading towards Brooklyn. And I says, when we get him around the, the turn, it's a very slick turn, coming from uh, Woodhaven going into Brooklyn. I believe it's the first exit towards Pennsylvania Avenue. I says, get next to him, and I start shooting. And I hit him in the head. Uh, 
he dies a couple weeks later in the hospital. The reality of what I do doesn't really hit these guys because they're not still, they're, they're guys, they're friends of mine, they're guys involved with me, but they're not killers. But when I tell them afterwards, where are we going to go? I says, let's dump this guns, let's dump this car, burn it. I tell them, you go burn this car, you go dump the guns in, a, in the ocean, and you guys meet me. Go, where are we going to meet? I says, we'll go meet at the diner, we'll go get something to eat. That's the reality for them. And they understand, like, this is obviously nothing to me. I'm going to kill, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to do whatever I got to do to be successful on the street. And by the, the more people that I make them understand that I'm on a different level of violence and I'm willing to put my life on a different level and I'm willing to put myself to kill somebody, to be killed, and you put yourself in those dangerous situations, you're also going to get stabbed up like I did. You're also going to get a shot like I did. You're also going to be in the hospital for months like I was. And you're going to have people that are just as wild as you or worse. They're going to try to take your life back. But that's what you signed up for. I was used to this. I knew I was going to go to the hospital. I knew I'd possibly get killed. I knew when someone pointed that gun at me, I was going to go towards them. I wasn't going to go away. And those are the incidences why I got shot up or stabbed up or batted myself because... My father trained me again at three years old. You're a fighter. You're a killer. You're a killing machine. When all these guys are telling you they're fighters, they're killers, and they're shooters, I know there's an instinct like any other fighter that gets in a ring or a, an army vet that goes to war. They know what their job is when they get there. The guys that are seeing action understand what we're really facing. They understand that maybe their guts are gonna get torn out. Maybe they're gonna get shot in the body, in the head. Maybe it's gonna end right now. But you take that adrenaline and you use it in a positive way, not in a negative way. Because you're used to that adrenaline, you're used to that fear factor. Because we all have fear, but the people that can't handle that fear, it hurts them. The people that can handle that fear and that adrenaline rush in a positive way, take that and they use it in their benefit. And things kind of slow down for you when you're in this mode. They don't speed up. They're, they're very precise. They're very calculated moves that I'm making. People on the outside say, oh, this guy's berserk. No, I'm not berserk. There's guys, there's friends of mine like Angelo Costelli that went half drunk, half cocked up to hurt somebody. And he ended up getting killed. He, uh, he pistol whipped somebody. They took the gun. They shot him in the back. They shot him in the head because... He's not going in a calculated mindset. He's going in a half-cocked mindset. So these are the guys that Fat Andy Ruggiano, Al Greco, told me, uh, if you want to be that killer, if you want to be that guy on the street, you want to be that professional, you have to use intelligence behind the killing. You have to use intelligence behind making money. You have to use the toughness that you have and, and the ability to be able to get hurt and overcome it or stabbed up or shot with no fear. And you have to do it in a very smart way, in a very calculating way. I started, I, I was trained for this. And as the years went on and I'm killing and I'm shooting and I'm batting and I'm stabbing, it's taken a mental effect on me. Something that I really don't realize because you're in the moment. You're like a ball player that's up with bases loaded in, a, in, in the World Series. The only difference is when you're hitting that ball, because I was a baseball player, right? I had a scholarship. and So when I'm up, I'm used to that training with baseball and that zone in and a concentration and you're in a zone, you can't hear the crowd. That was me until everything shuts down. And then you realize I can't sleep at night. I start seeing some of these dead bodies. All the violence, all the shooting, all the stabbing starts taking a mental effect on you. And then you end up with, I have PTSD because there's no way you can kill and shoot and stab the way I did and not having a mental effect somewhere. Although at the time you're blocking it out. At one point in your life, it's gonna come at, at you. So when I put my head on the pillow, I can fall asleep. I'll sleep an hour, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, even two hours, but not more than that. And then I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down. 
And you have these uh, anxiety attacks. You have these uh, control factors of your temperament when someone's trying to needle you a little bit and try to get a reaction. You're trying to control what you couldn't really control over the years. Even though you thought you were under control, you were in control on the incident. But overall, you look for this. You look for the excuse for the violence. You look for the reason that someone's getting out of line so you can release what you want to release. And what you want to release is to tear these people apart for whatever wrong they did or for whatever job you're taking care of. You're back zoned in, but you're not realizing one day that you're gonna end up like me and you're gonna end up in therapy for years. And if you don't end up in therapy for years, you're never gonna help yourself. You never get a moment's peace, whether it's sleeping or whether it's just getting a burger somewhere. You're, this is gonna be a 24 hour seven on your mind. Mm -hmm. And as this became another level of training for me, not the violence that I trained for, but now this is to have some sort of solitude, to be able to enjoy life again, to be able to smile, laugh, and to go back into having some sort of normal life. You have to retrain yourself. The way I trained myself since I'm three years old, I started training myself now with meditation, working out, therapy, uh, dealing with PTSD is difficult, but I deal with it by talking to other people that deal with it. I'm very involved with veterans, that uh, friends of mine that were serious uh, snipers, killers, uh, war heroes through uh, different wars, Iraq, Afghanistan. And these guys, uh, we talk about what it feels like to kill. We talk about uh, the guys that are perpetrating a fraud, and we know who they are by the way they talk, why they act, those actions, how we control ourselves not to hurt these type of guys, how not to go backwards and kill these guys. And, you know, it's another development stage uh, that it's, a, it's always a work in progress. It's no different than somebody who has a drink and a drug problem. You just say to yourself, I'm gonna get through today and tomorrow I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow, but let me just get through the next 24 hours. So you take it as a day-to-day -day thing so when people are po pointing or poking at the bear, you know what's in you. You know that you can take them out like this. You know that it's nothing for you to go kill another guy or stab up another guy or track them down and beat them senseless until uh, you just tear his body apart. These are normal everyday actions of somebody like myself. Uh, and I know there's not a lot of guys like myself out there. And the problem is when they disrespect or talk to you in a certain way, you got to be able to control yourself, control your ego and say to yourself, if I'm ever going to change my life and be a better person, I need to work with therapists and I need to work with others that feel the same thing I feel, guys that will... Uh, real guys, like guys like my friend Brian or JD or some of the guys I talk to, Stevie, Uncle Steve, or guys that I know were legitimate killers, whether it was legitimate for the government, for armed forces, for uh, uh, police work, but the guys that actually were out there uh, doing what I was doing, they really understand it. The frauds we know, we can, we can see the way they speak, the way they talk, and we know uh, for us, it's just a light switch. You go to the wall, you turn the light on and off. It's the same with us. You could turn that light on and off. And uh, I turned my light off a long time ago. For 10 years now, I work with kids. I try to help them uh, not to fall into that trap and don't develop into that killer I developed into. So it's a good feeling that's my new adrenaline rush. This is how I control my past is by saving other kids' lives so they don't end up dead, they don't end up killing others, they don't end up uh, trying to get retribution for some of the acts of disrespect of guys on the street. And as I work with these kids, it strengthens me further and further to continue on my path of uh, saving lives and giving back. And at the same time, it helps me to uh, cure myself of uh, the urges, 
to hurt people, kill people that are, I believe are wrong in me or my family or friends. And it helps me with my PTSD. And as I continue on the journey, um, hopefully uh, I keep saving lives. And this is my, my, my way of uh, saving myself and saving others. And I became this Johnny elite, not uh, the old Johnny. You know, people ask me on a regular basis, do I regret uh, the things that happened in my life? And I say, uh, you know, there's things I wish didn't happen, but I don't regret them. I think saying I regret them is saying that my life was worthless all these years. All I did was, maybe this was my path. This was God's choice for me to go this way so I could save lives. So I, I can't say that I, I really regret them because because of the life I lived, it gives me the experience to be able to save these kids. And, and I think maybe that's what it was meant to be. It's as simple as that. I was meant for this path uh, to save kids and save adults from going down that path. Maybe I want to believe that and that's how I get through my my uh, bad life. I mean, the violence. But I think it's it's something that uh, the way I deal with it, and uh, I learned from it. My my lesson from from all this is uh, we're all human, and I think uh, as you go through life, you're going to experience things from an extreme, and you know so. Did I learn? I learned that uh, violence doesn't solve anything. I could kill, hurt, and stab as many people as I did, and the next guy just thinks he's not going to be the victim. He'll just keep poking at you. And you got to say to yourself, uh, control yourself. Uh, don't do what you used to do. If you do, you're going to go down that path, and it's not going to just be him. You're going to go after each guy that uh, is agitating you, instigating you, and... That's not a path of having a, a good life. You gotta look in the mirror and say, I like myself a lot more than I hate this guy. And the more you like yourself, the more it'll stop you from going to kill the next guy or hurt the next guy. And it gives you the uh, strength to say, instead of killing this guy or hurting this guy, let me save this guy here instead. Let me teach this guy a lesson that I'm learning through life, through uh, hospitals, through murder, through morgues through uh, the streets that I grew up with and, and turn my life the way I did and don't turn back to the bad ways again. So I think that life experience for all of us uh, is just our journey, whatever that may be. And this uh, was my journey uh, and there's no way to take it back. So I embrace it and try to work with it. And the things that I did that were horrible, I try to pass that along to young kids so they don't follow that path. And I end up here where I am today. All right, John, thank you so much. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks. Thanks.